This is Fit to Succeed in partnership with NordicFitnessEducation.com with host Ben Pratt. Thanks for joining us. Two people that are identical otherwise, age, gender, and size, the, someone might have a resting metabolic rate of 2,400 calories. Mm-hmm. And the discussion here is, well, let's talk about what not that much really looks like. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> someone else may have a resting metabolic rate of 800 calories. And that's crazy. That That's a person to where there's no possible way they can safely diet to lose weight without becoming nutritionally bankrupt. Mm-hmm. That's when there's some big endocrine compromise suppressing the metabolic rate. Hello, listeners, and welcome to this episode of the Fit to Succeed show. I'm excited today because I have somebody who's influenced my own nutritional practice, somebody whose work I came across perhaps six, seven years ago, and his name is Dr. Alan Christiansen. Dr. Alan, it's wonderful to have you with us here today. Hey, Ben. Glad to be with you. Let's have some fun. I hope so. I hope so. Now, just to put the the listeners in the picture, Dr. Allen is a certified naturopathic doctor. He began his integrative practice in uh, at his clinic back in 1996 and has written several different books, and we're going to get into two of those today. Now, whilst you've been in practice for many years, Dr. Allen, uh, you further established your reputation uh, with expertise in the field of adrenal research and in stress and the effects of stress upon the body. Now, I'm sure you're aware that way back in 2002, another doctor by the name of James Wilson also wrote a book called Adrenal Fatigue and termed it the 21st Century Stress Syndrome. Now, what I would like to ask to kind of kick things off is how does his concept, Dr. Wilson's concept of adrenal fatigue, compare with the concept you discussed in your book about adrenal reset? Yeah, yeah, great, great question, Dan. Uh, Dr. Wilson's a personal friend, he's done a lot of good work. And he spoke, I think, in a lot of ways for an emerging concept that was growing within the the industry, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And he conceptualized it as saying that there's this condition that causes many symptoms, uh, generalized fatigue, body aches, food cravings, and can be ameliorated by various strategies, you know, Mm -hmm. mind-body rest, relaxation, uh, stabilizing blood sugar, you know, avoiding stimulants. And he argued that the mechanism taking place was a, a weakness of the adrenal glands and an inability to make cortisol. He talked about Addison's disease and how we know about a state in which the adrenals, pretty much all or nothing, can't really function at all. We can't make mm-hmm. anything. And the argument was that adrenal fatigue was a milder form of this in which the glands are not shot, but they can't work as well as they should. Mm-hmm. And again, these were works, these are views that were shared by many at the time and still are shared by many and have created a lot of just confusion and contention, I think. Right. And my work parallels all of that except for the mechanism. And I think it is an important distinction. So the mechanism that's been proposed is that these adrenals get weakened, they get fatigued, and and yes, they can in disease states, but the evidence is pretty strong that in people that have perhaps abnormal cortisol rhythms, maybe they've got low salivary cortisol, even low serum cortisol, but but they don't have Addison's disease. So yes, they can have a lot of these symptoms. Many of these recommendations can help them, but inside their bodies, the adrenal glands aren't making less hormone because they can't. And they're making less hormone because the body asks them not to. So the big distinction comes out really in terms of a lot of thoughts around therapy. You know, if it were an inability to make this main hormone cortisol, for example, then that concept would support the popular approach of giving supplemental cortisol. Mm -hmm. Many doctors are prescribers, and we have the option of prescribing oral cortisol replacement. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Addison's, it's life-saving. It's essential. But I argue that in the case of what's called adrenal fatigue, that the low cortisol is not the source of symptoms. It's part of the condition that the body's responding to. Mm-hmm. So giving cortisol may benefit symptoms or doing botanical medicines that, that cause the body to elevate its own cortisol. Those things can help short-term symptoms, but ultimately they're at odds with the body's goal, which is trying to give itself a chance to repair. Mm-hmm. So if I recall right, uh, Dr. Mm-hmm. Wilson's book, he talked about three stages, didn't he, of cortisol dysfunction, where he mm-hmm. referred to type 1, 2, and 3. And one was uh, the, the hypersecretion, where there was a lot of cortisol being released. 
And then there was a kind of an in-between stage where you might miss that because cortisol looks normal. And then there was the type three, which is cortisol becomes very, very low. And what you're suggesting here, Dr. Allen, is the difference is that instead of the adrenal gland being weak and not able to produce cortisol, but you're saying there's a negative feedback loop. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly. shutting cortisol down? Yeah. And this is quite objectively measurable. So right. cortisol output is mediated by the pituitary gland. You know, the whole endocrine system is like a CEO and hypothalamus or like a corporation. So the hypothalamus is the CEO and the pituitary is the manager and the various glands like the adrenals, they're the workers. Mm -hmm. So the pituitary, the manager tells the glands to work and then they work. If they're not told to work, they don't work. So right. the pituitary makes ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone, and that activates the adrenals. And when the body wishes them to work harder, the pituitary puts out more ACTH and they're yelled at, you know, mm -hmm. and then vice versa. If the body wishes to slow them down, the body decreases ACTH output. Mm -hmm. So in Addison's disease, you'll see low cortisol and you'll see very high ACTH. Right. And what's happening there is the adrenals are not working, but your body is yelling at them to work and they're the weak link. But in this state that's called adrenal fatigue, you can still see low cortisol, but you'll also see low ACTH or normal ACTH. And what that means is the adrenals are not working hard because they're not being told to work hard. <laughs> uh, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. That, that kind of makes me feel that we should jump back just a, a little bit because perhaps we've jumped right into the endocrinology here, which is great. And I love that. But uh, stress, of course, is a very real concern in modern society. And uh, it's quite clear, even from that early discussion we've just had, that it has quite profound effects upon the body. Um, why does uh, stress have such an impact upon the hormonal system and how can that cause it to become dysfunctional? Yeah, so stress, we think about mental emotional stress, which is real and powerful. There's also many things that disrupt our chemistry that don't fall under that rubric, but are still stressors. You know, blood sugar changes, temperature changes, and the body does its best to adapt to those. And when it's trying too hard to adapt to too great of a stressor, too many stressors, or too much duration of stressor, then this daily rhythm becomes altered. So the adrenals, they're part of what we call this HPA axis, and that's the hypothalamus, pituitary, and the adrenals. Right. And if there's too many disruptors at once, how they control the body's daily cycle becomes thrown off. A healthy cycle is a lot of cortisol made in the morning and then shut off as the day goes along. Right. But because this HPA axis manages stress, if the stressors are severe, then that can change that, that timing. It's also relevant for those that have had large stressors early in life, you know, before age 18. All these things can make it to where the body's response mechanisms, the stress response mechanisms, they become hair triggered mm -hmm. and they can become over responsive to milder things. And, and yeah, when that rhythm changes, that rhythm dictates everything in the body. The circadian cycle, everything you can think of is governed on that rhythm and on that cycle. Mm -hmm. And so when it's thrown off, blood sugar regulation, detox, hormone regulation, the body's immune response, uh, gut repair, brain chemistry, nerve cell regeneration, everything's just not functioning as well. You know, mm -hmm. the body's always in all hands on deck mode and never gets to go into rest and repair mode. Right. And I understand that, uh, that we produced and, and wrote a course about sleep and the ability to sleep well. And cortisol was one of the hormones we looked at. And, and from what I understand, when cortisol is dysregulated and we have elevated cortisol at night relative to morning time, it actually throws sleep out as well. Is that correct? That's totally true. There's, there's almost like a seesaw relationship between cortisol and melatonin being mm -hmm. the main sleep hormone. Another big thing we see is that it's a break from cortisol during sleep that allows the liver to do work to control the blood sugar throughout the rest of the day. Oh, fascinating. That's really interesting. Really interesting. Now, in terms of that stress load of modern society and the, 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 you know, the, the go, go, go that we kind of work through these days, are there any other hormonal systems that are at risk of dysfunction beyond just a simple cortisol relationship? Well, this is a case to where you know, all roads lead to Rome. Um, mm -hmm. Cortisol itself has effects on governing how other hormones are received across the cells. So hormones are, are messengers, they're sent off by these glands, and mm -hmm. they flow throughout the bloodstream. And then some target tissues respond to them more than others. And they do so when receptors open and absorb the hormone. So right. we've got hormone receptors in the lining of the uterus, for example. And if estrogen is present, 
and the receptors are responsive, estrogen can have a proliferating effect upon the uterine lining. Mm -hmm. But if the receptors are not, not responsive, it's just like that hormone fluctuation didn't occur. And so that cortisol cycle, not just having it or not having it, but it's that cycle of cortisol that gives you proper cell permeability. And the body has that as one more level of control over all the hormones, the thyroid, the ovarian, the testicular hormones. So the body can adjust cortisol if it wishes to fine tune how those hormones are used at a cellular level. And consequently, when cortisol is disrupted, then even if the other glands are doing perfect jobs, then the net effect can be altered. All right. And, and obviously the most common disruption is when we say disrupted is the lowering of the morning time cortisol and the increasing of the evening cortisol. So how does, does that have a direct effect upon any particular hormonal systems when it's altered in that pattern? You know, quick, quick uh, expansion. I'm, I'm not sure most common. Uh, if, if cortisol, ideally morning high, nighttime low, mm -hmm. if it's always high, uh, always low or, or backward, right. they all lead to that same problem. Oh, they so really? any way that it's not in that good rhythm, sometimes you'll even see it up and down a few times in the day, but yeah, any way it's not right can, can do that. And, and it can act on all hormones uh, in terms of timing in which are most salient. So some of the effects that it has are more pronounced throughout longer periods of time in the case of menstrual hormones because they're you know, monthly cycles. Uh, daily effects may be more pronounced for thyroid hormones. This also has effects upon how readily thyroid hormones get degraded. So your thyroid releases hormones that govern your overall basal metabolic rate, mm -hmm. and after they've been released, they're broken down into more active and less active hormones. Mm -hmm. And that breakdown process can become altered in the absence of a proper cortisol cycle. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you kind of talked about in your book, The Adrenal Reset Diet, uh, the impact that a dysregulation of cortisol, I, and I'm assuming from any of those altered patterns that you identified there, that a dysregulation of cortisol can be one of the factors that leads to weight gain. I wonder if you could uh, explain that a little to the listeners. Yeah. To be super, super precise, it can partition how the body stores fuel. Mm -hmm. So we have insulin that can target fuel towards muscle mass or it can target fuel towards visceral fat. Mm -hmm. So the same scenario, your body will put more energy into the muscles when you're in a good, healthy state. You know, you're just to anthropomorphize a bit, if your body feels that the world around you is safe and that food supplies will be consistent and that it might even be a safe time to reproduce, you know, then more, more energy goes to muscle mass. Mm -hmm. But if the perception is that you are in times of danger, then along with that, your body assumes at a subconscious level that food supply may not be secure and there may be food famines that are soon to come. So rather than put fuel in the muscles where you're apt to burn it up in the short term, you'll put that fuel in fat stores where it's harder to access, especially visceral fat stores. So you got to reroute that. And to be really precise, the adrenals make cortisol and cortisone. Mm -hmm. And cortisone's a weaker precursor of cortisol. Right. And when this timing gets thrown off, parts of your body outside of your adrenals, they push more cortisone into cortisol. And that's how the fuel gets directed towards the, the visceral fat. All right. So, so you're saying then that people who have that dysregulation, uh, that it affects a number of systems, but in particular, uh, fat storage, the partitioning of fuels, as you suggested there, ends up more around the middle, around the yeah. visceral fat, around the organs and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm, exactly. And obviously, we know from for years now that that increased fat around the middle can be a, a perhaps a higher risk factor of other health problems. Very much so. One more exciting thing that I learned more about since then, we all did more about since then, was this mm -hmm. phenomenon of intermuscular adipose tissue. So along with the muscle tissue not being as full of fuel, glycogen especially, then the fuel that it does have, it's more apt to retain and less apt to utilize. So... Mm -hmm. I match or intermuscular adipose tissue is an emerging condition that we've, we've known about muscle loss for some time with age, sarcopenia, age-related muscle loss. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing that not even age-related, but just prolonged bouts of inactivity can give rise to this buildup of fatty tissue. It's just like a marbled steak. You know, it's right, just more yeah. fat in the muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. And it makes the muscles less able to take up that fuel and hold on to it and use it when the body needs it. And that impairs muscular performance, 
but also it takes away one more level of blood sugar regulation in the system. Mm-hmm. Well, that's interesting. Um, what I, I, I wonder if you're, uh, just to clarify for myself actually here, is that when we're talking about fat building up around the muscle, are we talking like around the fibers, the fascicles of the muscle? Because I know in research that I've done around people who go on like a, a low carbohydrate, high fat ketogenic style diet, that they actually build up what they refer to as intramuscular triglycerides, which helps to fuel the aerobic system in the muscle. Uh, and that you know, maintains performance, whereas you just impl- implied that IMAT diminishes performance. Can you just clarify that if you're aware of that? Yeah, that's primarily between the fascicles from, from the, right. the data that's come out. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's not actually inside the fibers themselves and supplying the fuel. It's just becoming a, a dormant fat, so to speak, around the muscle tissue. Correct. It's more, more toxic and less amenable to beta oxidation. All right. That's fascinating. Fascinating. Now, just before we jump off the subject of stress, because I do want to talk about your new book, um, I wonder if you could just share with the listeners just maybe one or two quick and easy strategies that they could apply to help improve their own stress management and to support good adrenal health. Yeah. So one thing that's probably the most relevant is the, w- what your morning routine looks like. And the two facets of that that I'd argue have the biggest effects would be uh, how soon you get exposed to to light, like right. serious light, not just like flipping the lights on, but actual sunlight or the equivalency of that. Mm-hmm. And then also how soon you have your first protein containing meal. Oh, wow. So it seems that those things are really big drivers of turning on the body's cortisol awakening response. And in anticipation of that, from what the habit has been for prior days, the body anticipates when the day should start. And, and that first step, that cortisol awakening response, that dictates the whole rest of the 24 hour cycle. So having those things occur well, affect how well you sleep at night and affect how well you wake up the following days and affect energy throughout the day. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating to hear you talk about that in relation to cortisol, because I've often heard that particular strategy in relation to sleep, that uh, in order to get your sleep cycles right, you should get lots of sunlight early in the morning. Yeah, and that's, that's why that cortisol spike almost like sets the momentum for the cortisol plummet, which is the melatonin spike later on in the day. All right, excellent. That's fascinating. Now let's just shift shift gears now and talk a bit more about the metabolism reset diet. Sounds like the sister book to the first one. Uh, (laughs) And in that particular book, uh, you discuss the the concept of being over fat in preference to being overweight. I, I wonder if you could just clarify that, please. Oh, for sure. Such a big thing. So that's a term that's been used in research to to collectively refer to those that have just too much scale weight and then too, too little muscle mass, you know, those that have appropriate scale weight, but too little muscle mass, too much fatty tissue. And the data now suggests this is by far the vast majority of the population. And it's the biggest predictor of so many health complications. You know, we've seen for a while, there's been almost an enigma about how some people can be on the heavier side, but not develop diabetes or metabolic complications. And then others, the opposite. They appear not to be heavy, but they, they get these illnesses. And so it seems that we've got our own individual set points for how much fat we tolerate within the organs. There's a, there's a hierarchy of how we, we take in fuel from the diet, carbs, fats, exogenous ketones, even alcohol. They all become fuel in one sense. Mm-hmm. And we then move those throughout the system. And there's a hierarchy of storage containers. Like the, the first places we put it are the safest. And the more steps we've got to overflow into, the more dangerous it becomes. Yeah. And I mentioned before about intermuscular adipose tissue. So when your muscles are healthy, you've got enough muscle tissue. It's not burdened with toxic fat. And it's active. It's being used. It's a nice place to store fuel. It's right there. And you got it. It's a safe place to have access to it. Mm-hmm. Now, when that's overflowing, the next step is subcutaneous fat. This is the stuff that, you know, it may have cosmetic concerns, it may do cellulite, but it doesn't seem to be a large risk factor for health issues. But that will then overflow into the visceral fat, which overflows into Mm -hmm. two levels of organ fat. The Mm -hmm. first one is fat that builds up inside organ cells, primarily liver, secondary pancreas cells. And then the next level is the fat that builds up between those organ cells. And the final reservoir is just the bloodstream. So when there's no more place for fuel, that's when we see blood glucose, blood triglycerides, blood ketones. They're elevating because there's just nowhere left to put it all. And that's the most dangerous site of all. So it's almost like an overflow into the bloodstream. Completely. And all the mechanisms before then have varying degrees of one being more dangerous than the next, Mm -hmm. but they're they're all protective places to put it. 
Mm-hmm. And so it's, uh, it sounds like that ultimately comes from a, an, an excess of fuels themselves being constantly put into the body. An excess of fuels, a low amount of fuel utilization, or a poor capacity to burn the fuel that's there. So yeah, there, there can be some combination of those things. Well, that's a good clarification. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Now, why, why then is this uh, overfat state, or I suppose we could also refer to it as this low lean body mass, so relatively body fat that is sounds higher. sounds nicer. <laughs> yeah, low lean body mass. Why is that a, considered a greater risk factor then? Is that purely because of the, with a loss of muscle tissue, we therefore would have a loss of meta- metabolic rate? Or is there more? Well, that's the thing is that whatever... Whenever we reach the state to where our, our composition is compromised, we really lost that first big safest bucket. You know, now that big safe bucket is not doing its job as well. Right. So that fuel overflow is hitting everything else. And this is counterintuitive, but we think about a lot of things that are valid concerns, like icky chemicals that come in our body or the stress of the dangers from infection or whatnot. The largest chemical trauma and the thing that wears our cells out, like in a complete class all by itself. Mm-hmm. is converting fuel into energy. You know, nothing else is remotely close to that. No, really? <laughs> the most dangerous thing we could ever do is to jam glucose inside of a mitochondria that can't take it up, or triglycerides, jam them somewhere that the body can't take it. There's no more surefire way to kill organelles than that. Mm-hmm. So that's why we have all this hierarchy. And once we start having less ability to keep the fuel in safer buckets, that's when we see all the illness emerge, all the chronic disease. Now, I know when, we, uh, when you look at sort of uh, the metabolic components of the body, the, the largest is always considered to be the basal metabolic rate, which is the mm-hmm. total sort of metabolism of the body. Uh, and you've talked there about the, the next step is the muscles and the ability to burn off that body fat. But I know that from a lot of people who diet, we often see that uh, metabolism can be lowered or through sedentary living or th- poor sleep that we get this drop in metabolism. Um, yeah. What is it, what's the driver behind that? What, what, why does that occur? Yeah, so two big variables about metabolism. There's the, the overall rate of it, and then it's flexibility. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll answer that. What I've been talking before about those buckets and the muscles and all that, that's really about the flexibility. Yeah, that's how so much room you've got to soak up fuel and let fuel out. But back to your question, the overall rate of metabolism, the, lar- the two largest controllers of that, many things affect it in, in almost insignificant ways. But the two biggest drivers were back to just you know, body composition, just how much muscle mass you're carrying around. And, and then also your, your health of your thyroid hormones, how mm-hmm. well thyroid hormones are utilized throughout the body. So in, 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 normal, in normal physical function, there can be about a 60% variation in basal metabolic rate based upon thyroid status if it's yeah, really? too high or too low. You know, for quite a while, we would measure resting metabolic rate among people. And there are many who... Uh, there's so much data saying that the bulk of us can't do a great job accurately remembering or gauging our food intake. We have a hard time, you know, being correct with that. So many people, and I've been in this boat where it feels like, why I'm not eating that much? Why is my weight where it is? And many will say that and we'll measure resting metabolism. And two people that are identical, otherwise age, gender, and size, the, someone might have a resting metabolic rate of 2,400 calories. Mm-hmm. And the discussion here is, well, let's talk about what not that much really looks like. You know? yeah. <laughs> Someone else may have a resting metabolic rate of 800 calories. And that's crazy. That, that's a person to where there's no possible way they can safely diet to lose weight without becoming nutritionally bankrupt. Mm-hmm. That's when there's some big endocrine compromise suppressing their metabolic rate. Mm-hmm. And, and does that compromise come from multiple sources or systems or, or is it primarily because uh, like you suggested that the thyroid can uh, can kind of deregulate and, and drop down in terms of its rate of performance? It's the biggest driver and it does impact other parts of the endocrine system, but by itself it's, it controls it more than any other factor by far. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So, it's a, so what symptoms then might individuals have that they're that there may be some problems with regards to thyroid, you know, at subclinical level before they might actually get diagnosed potentially with a problem with their thyroid. So here's the funny thing, Ben, and this is a, one of my little platforms. So subclinical, in the States, the term is defined in the medical circles, and the natural medicine world uses it in the exact opposite way that it's defined. Mm-hmm. So subclinical means below a clinical threshold. So yes. you don't, there's no clinical signs or symptoms. So mm-hmm. subclinical thyroid disease has laboratory abnormalities. They've got a high TSH, normal T4, but they have zero symptoms whatsoever. So the person and would look and feel relatively normal. They say, I'm fine. What do you mean? There's no, I have no issues at all. <laughs> and and in, in, the, in, the, in the States here, all the natural people who do thyroid treatment, 
they refer to that state, they call subclinical disease, someone who's symptomatic but has normal lab levels. Right. And it means the exact opposite. It's someone who has mm -hmm. abnormal lab levels with zero symptoms. Mm -hmm. So for so here, there are, here in the UK, it tends to be the other way around. Someone has symptoms that they're complaining about. They go to the doctor. The doctor runs a bunch of labs, and the labs come up as you're in the normal range. No, uh, that's yeah, a very so common scenario. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that's often mis misapplied, mislabeled sure. clinical disease. It's a super common scenario. So it's, right. that's a small academic distinction I'm making. But right, I appreciate you know, the distinction. <laughs> <laughs> lots of people are in that boat. And... Yeah, some symptoms are more specific than others. The funny thing is that since your thyroid hormones control absolutely everything, any symptom you imagine could be involved. Mm -hmm. And many of the symptoms are horribly vague, and they're not very specific through the thyroid. Which like fatigue or something like that. Sure. So, so one big point that makes the symptoms more specific and more suspicious, that's a tongue twister, <laughs> is they've come on after a certain time frame. So there may be things you've struggled with forever, and that still could be relevant. But if it's something that changed in concert with other symptoms at a certain time frame, that's much more suspicious. So some, some big academic surveys of people with thyroid disease and their symptoms showed that, uh, like for example, more constipation was a stronger predictor than constipation was as far as a reported right. symptom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. or more muscular pain as opposed to just muscular pain. So right. small thing, but much stronger predictor. Mm -hmm. And then also among the more specific symptoms, the thyroid gland itself, we think about its structure and its proximity. And when it is diseased, in many states, it can change in its size and its, and its structure. And so in those cases, we can see impact upon speaking or swallowing. Mm -hmm. We will talk about their voice being hoarser or swallowing being more difficult. So, so all the symptoms you may have heard about, uh, weight gain, fatigue, hair loss, totally true, totally relevant. Mm -hmm. But especially when there's a time component shift, and especially if you see some structural symptoms as well, mm -hmm. uh, sensation of fullness in the throat, you know, difficulty swallowing, lump in the throat, hoarser voice, those are some of the more specific indicators. Oh, fantastic. I appreciate you sharing those. That's uh, certainly uh, thought-provoking. In, in the met metabolic reset diet or metabolism reset diet, sorry, um, you, you talk quite a bit about the liver and, and the, the, there's a central role that the liver seems to play with metabolic balance. Uh, would you yeah. mind expanding on that? For sure. So we talked a bit there about the best basal metabolic rate and you have body mass, thyroid function, and then metabolic flexibility. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, our fuel that we take in is never what we're using at the moment. You can imagine a, if a car had no gas tank, you would need like an infinitely long hose from the gas pump, right? <laughs> so <laughs> our bodies have a gas tank. You know, we mm -hmm. store fuel because we're not filling up as we're driving. You know, we're filling up every so often. Whatever mm -hmm. your frequency is, doesn't matter. You're not eating constantly. So we've got all these various gas tanks, and I kind of outlined that hierarchy, but the liver is the main hub that governs all that. So when it's working well, it's able to allow the body to safely take in fuel in a way that it can get out again later on. Mm -hmm. you know, imagine that your gas tank worked to where in your car, you, know, you filled up with 10 gallons, but you can only get nine gallons out of it. Every time you filled it, you can only get out 90% of what you put in. So either you'd have like no gas reserve or you'd have this ever expanding overflow of gas that your gas tank is getting bigger and bigger, but you can't use all of it. Mm -hmm. So that's what's happening in these over fat states. The fuel is coming in and your body is storing it, but that reverse mechanism is not working as well. Mm -hmm. So the weight becomes a struggle and then also energy becomes a struggle because you can't access the stored fuel as well between meals. Mm -hmm. I understand. So uh, I, I'm just wondering whether this has some, some bearing because I know that the liver manages certain fuels differently to others. For example, when we eat carbohydrates and we get down to glucose, that can be you know, taken directly into the bloodstream and start to fill those reserve tanks like you've talked about. But if we, Glycogen, yeah. Yeah, if we eat a large amount of fructose, then that is dealt with biochemically differently and has to be managed via the liver through the hepatic mm -hmm. portal vein. Can you perhaps explain, uh, you know, does that have some bearing on this ability of the, uh, of the liver to play a role in metabolism? You know, it's pretty bizarre. Had you asked me about seven years ago, I would have given you a different answer. Um, I've looked at a lot of human and animal studies since then, and mm -hmm. it's really, the body has this threshold of energy balance. And when you're above or below this threshold, it's a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. So the, the more recent studies on fructose overfeeding in animals, for example, They've shown that, yeah, you can take a, a rat and you can have them just going to make up some stuff. They need, you know, 100 units of 100 pieces of rat chow to break even on their body mass, you know, making yes. this up completely. 
So if you take that and you add on 10 more units of fructose, you can give that rat fatty liver in no time. Right. Now, if you take that same rat and you take away 10 units of their rat chow, so now they've got 90 units of rat chow and you give them 10 units of fructose, there's no liver issues whatsoever. All right. You take that same rat and you give them their 100 units of rat chow and you add in 10 units of butter, you know, they're going to get fatty liver all day long. Oh, really? Yeah, it's wow. a, but it's only when you're above that energy balance threshold. Ah, I see. So it, there has to be a, an, an excess of caloric need before we start to see those problems with fatty liver. Is that what you're saying? To really dial in, I talk about fuel versus calories. Um, protein, fibers, resistant starch, they're a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, alcohol is a little bit more toxic. But if you talk about carbs, fats, ketones, they're completely identical as far as that fuel equation. Right, they so all break down to a common substrate called oxaloacetate. Mm -hmm. And any of those at a state of overload becomes problematic. And specifically what happens is you've got fuel stored as glycogen and, and as triglyceride. Now, you need glycogen to access triglyceride to get that triglyceride burned in beta oxidation. Mm -hmm. So the pathology that occurs is that they become out of proportion. You get too little glycogen relative to triglyceride. And in the cells, you can see in disease states that they're just all waxy and fatty. And, there's, and all the little spots that carry glycogen are crowded out. So you've got all this stuff that you theoretically could use, but you've got no way to spark and ignite it and burn it properly. All right. So if I understand you correctly, you're saying that uh, when perhaps more particularly like muscle tissue and tissues that utilize glycogen, when they have kind of... The liver tissue right now is what I'm speaking about. Oh, and the liver as well, I suppose, is the other major glycogen store beyond the muscles, isn't it? Uh, when they are full of glycogen... Because it can't use ketones for fuel. The liver is the one organ that can't do that. So it's okay. completely dependent upon glycogen to access stored triglyceride. Ah, so that's, that's fascinating. So when those glycogen stores are, are full... You say that that's when we start to see that, uh, that excessive deposits of waxy fat starting to build up in the liver. I'm saying when the glycogen is compromised, that's when the body cannot access the waxy fat that's built up. And, and what conditions would, would, would lead to that compromise? So that's that equation of, of that fuel overload from too much. So I'll back up a little more and explain this further. But yeah, that's too much fuel, too little fuel being, being burnt or inability to burn it. So there's a much more finite capacity to store glycogen than there is triglyceride. Mm -hmm. So when you're pouring on more and more fuel, you know, just, you know, fats are more energy dense. They take yes. up less space. So mm -hmm. your liver can crowd in more and more triglycerides in the cells and around the cells, but you've got a very finite capacity for glycogen. Mm -hmm. So when you're at that fuel excess state for long periods of time, that's the emergence of fatty liver. So that's, that's, that's foie gras. You know, that's, how foie gras is formed. It's the exact same process. Mm -hmm. and it sounds very similar to what happens with, you know, muscle tissue and subcutaneous body fat, that when the muscle tissues can't take on any more storage, it gets thrown into subcutaneous body fat, but you're happening specifically around the liver itself. Is that a fair comparison? Mm -hmm. Completely. Mm -hmm. And what's different is that other tissues have a little more flexibility in burning fat with less dependency upon glycogen than the liver does. Mm -hmm. All right, fantastic. Now, we're just about coming up in time, but one of the things I've, I love about the Adrenal Reset Diet and then also the Metabolism Reset Diet is you always have, a, have created these nice practical aspects to the books towards the end, lots of ideas about how you can put in place strategies and dietary approaches to help support. I wonder if you could just explain very briefly to the listeners how the Metabolism Reset Diet's practical elements differ from other mainstream diets, you know, like calorie restriction or low-carbohydrate dieting, something like that. Yeah, thank you. So the main distinction is that one thing is that it's a it's a finite process. You get in, you make a change, you get out, you know, and then you go back. And <laughs> That's nice. It's not not long term for for months and months. You know, I think most people have a reasonable sense of what a healthy lifestyle looks like, and I think that if their bodies work well, that healthy lifestyle should be able to serve them. So yeah, you can get in and make a change and have a healthy lifestyle work for you afterwards. So that that's one big distinction. The other one is that I think about fuel collectively. It's not carbs are evil, fat is good, you know, none of that. They're all really collectively sources of oxaloacetate. And you need a certain amount, and you can compromise that for a while. I do think about maintaining protein while you're in a lower fuel state. There's a lot of ways by which you can drop pounds and end up less lean afterward and be more metabolically compromised. Mm -hmm. So to support liver function, also to maintain muscular health, I do have people really assure an adequate maintenance protein intake while they are restricting fuel. Mm -hmm. and, and then I also do a lot of specific steps that help supplying foods and food combinations that help the various liver pathways of binding and excreting those trapped wastes inside of it. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so are you referring to the, the sort of the P, is it the P450 system, if I remember right, uh, for liver detox? Is it those systems you're trying to support or is it something else? That's a big part of that for sure. The, yeah, the cytochrome P450 systems, but also then a lot of the phase two conjugation and phase three glucuronidation pathways. And yeah, so really, and, and not in supporting, but also really optimizing. So it's mm -hmm. easy to have, especially the P450 be overactive relative to phase two. Mm -hmm. So correcting those ratios between them and supplying needed micronutrients and useful phytonutrients, kind of a bizarre concept. We think about a lot of plants being healthy, like you know, mm -hmm. broccoli or whatnot, and they only are because they're poisonous, you know. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, completely. <laughs> so bro great. broccoli makes all these glucosinolates, and we get all excited about what they do. They're insecticides. They're poisons. If we could get a lot of it, they're way more toxic than glyphosate. There's like mm -hmm. no debate about that. You know, no, if we really? could get those in our bodies, they would kill us. But as it stands, the microscopic amounts that we get in food tend to really in, um, activate our livers. Our livers like, hey, wow, this is not safe. I've got to, you know, get strong and get ready for battle. You know, mm -hmm. is that so a those, similar sort of th process to uh, to like salicates and things like tomatoes and peppers and stuff like that? Sure, completely. Yeah, so they're not they're actually not good for us, but they're mm -hmm. just enough poisonous to where it ends up being helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like a vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another topic altogether. Now, <laughs> Dr. Allen, if you could go back in time and speak to 1996 Dr. Allen, who's just about to open Integrative Health, uh, what <laughs> bit of advice would you offer him at this point with the knowledge you Oh, have? geez. Wow. <laughs> um, I would say don't change a thing. Go for it. Follow your instincts and impulses. It's going to work out really good over a while. There's going to be some tough stuff here and there, but Go for it. <laughs> oh, well, that's, that's, that's good advice. And I would say that to all the listeners. Uh, we've kind of jumped in and out of some kind of complex stuff as well as covering some very fundamental stuff. And, uh, you know, when we're trying to manage our client's health, I think it's really important that we're just confident enough to just go for it and do the best that we can with the knowledge that we now have. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Allen, it's been really wonderful talking to you in this interview. I really appreciate your expertise and your time. And I'd highly recommend the uh, listeners that you go and take some time to, to look up either of his main books. He's written more books than just the two, but The Adrenal Reset Diet, and the Metabolism Reset Diet are available to buy at all your local bookshops on Amazon and places like that. So uh, again, Dr. Allen, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure to be with you, Ben. Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful host. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and share via social media. You can also rate the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. If you'd like to know more about us, then check out our range of online courses at www.nordicfitnesseducation.com. 